have Dr. Taylor who's going to give us an amazing presentation. We have Oswald. He is a Texas Southern University uh, student. He is the current NSBE president there for the collegiate chapter, and he is going to introduce our next great speaker. Oswald, take it away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm gonna to be introducing Dr. Christiana. So, so please allow me to introduce Dr. Uh, Christiana Taylor, a distinguished authority in the fields of 3D printing and artificial intelligence, currently holding an executive position at Grantee. Dr. Taylor boasts a remarkable background with a PhD in aerospace and a profound understanding of aircraft and spacecraft. She's an accomplished expert in aerospace matters. Dr. Taylor is renowned for her ability to inspire creative thinking and professionalism through engaging public speaking, marked by a personable, reliable, and feminine touch. Beyond her professional um, powers, she is an avid global traveler, passionately exploring diverse cultures and culinary experience. As a former crew engineer and a Singularity University Global Scholar, her expertise spans various domains, making her a versatile and highly qualified contributor to engineering and technology discussions. Dr. Taylor Insight's promise, Insight promises to be both enlightening and captivating. So please help me and welcome Dr. Christiana Taylor. So first of all, thank you so much for the introduction. and. It's amazing to be back with Nesby. So I was actually a chapter president um, while I was an undergrad. I actually worked with the graduate um, conference and grad schools, and I was with Nesby Space for quite a few years before I went and did some other experiences. And so it's always wonderful to be back with Nesby with my roots. So thank you guys so much for having me. Um, first and foremost, uh, 90 minutes is a very long time. So I've actually split this up into three different areas. Um, and I'm calling it Explore, Navigate, and Create. So I am trying to split it up into about 30-minute segments. Um, Oswald's been kind enough to help me with if there's any questions or anything that pops up. Um, so please ask in the chat. I have a section where I want to discuss and kind of um, give space because, again, 90 minutes is a very long time to talk at someone. And I think the importance of entrepreneurship and developing community around this is to have a discussion. So please um, add questions in the chat. Um, Oswald's going to um, um, pause me anytime to um, respond to them. And I definitely have um, pauses in this in this presentation. Because again, 90 minutes is a long time. So with that said, thank you guys again for having me. Um, as he mentioned, I have a very diverse background. Um, but I found that I went to graduate school to get my PhD and I wanted to be a professor. And while doing that, I found that I did not particularly enjoy writing. Um, it's definitely a necessary thing in academia. And I wound up going the entrepreneurship route and learning that I really enjoy the chaos of um, building something from nothing. And that's what I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about because I feel like I've had a lot of really great insights as to one, how to build up a start, build a startup, two, how to assess that and figure out the strategy side, but three, space is my first love. Um, I've loved space ever since I was three years old and I saw Haley's Comet. So that's where I'm excited to be back in this space and in, in aerospace and being able to really contribute. So with not much further ado, my first spot, um, explore. So what is new space? Um, this talk is entitled Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship in the New Space Economy. So first of all, what is new space? Um, and I asked that question because you may have heard space 2.0 or um, new space or there's different terms that are you, you that have been used and it's kind of becomes marketing after after a certain point and it kind of becomes um, muddled. And so when I say new space, I am really talk. I am specifically talking about the range of activities and resources that create value and benefits um, in space for humanity. So literally just the um, resources that create value and create and what and values and values very is defined very different ways. But that's literally what I'm talking about, because the fa fact of the matter is, is that in the past, only governments could really contribute to space. I will never forget the very first NSBASC where we had all of the um, 
black um, black actors that uh, worked in Star Trek. And I remember Nicole Nichols um, speaking about how she met Dr. King and how she was such a representation. She meant so much to so many um, black people seeing themselves in space, seeing themselves in the future. And then when I met Mae Jameson, who the only person I've ever truly fangirled out on, um, and I have a hilarious story about her like, later if you want if you want to hear it, um, saying how she saw Nichelle Nichols and that's how she got inspired. Um, but in the past, only governments and uh, governments can participate in space, which limited it to civil servants who could participate as astronauts or in this in whatever the space economy was because it was bur burgeoning. Versus in the future, we're seeing that private citizens now can be in part of space. Um, private companies are part of space, and quite frankly, you as a consumer are part of space. Now, how we interact in this environment is very important because we're the ones that have to, as engineers, we're the ones that can drive that innovation. But if you're not a technical person, if you're not an engineer, if you're not, uh, I don't really wanna be in the entrepreneurship world, there's still ways, ways you can contribute and there's ways you can consume, consume space in a way that will still impact the future. But going back to the historical context, um, you know, Sputnik's launched in 1957, right? Um, and past that, we had a Cold War where we had this big competition between U.S. And, the, and Russia, which really had a huge space boom. Now we're talking the 60s, we're talking civil rights, we're talking a lot of changes happening and a lot of fear mongering, unfortunately. And then we had this we had this big competition. We landed on the moon, had all this technology that came out of it. And then we had this lull, which makes sense but if you're in space if that's your industry if that's your passion if that's your drive you understand that if the money isn't going towards your project if the money isn't coming towards space you can't participate and if governments are the only way to participate that means you and a lot of people have been boxed out in the past um but obviously a lot of things have changed vc funding private citizenship entrepreneurship has changed that so I want to talk about what's just happened in the past five years. I'm not even talking about like, you know, the past the past 15 or so since my my um ex my experience in, in space has happened. I'm talking about the past five years. We're talking about Mars Perseverance landing in 2021. JWST, which was a 20 years in the making project, landing launching in 2020 in 2021 as well. Commercial launches to the ISS, which means that we are looking at potentially having more space tourism. Um, space tourism coming up and the Artemis project meaning that we're actually getting a lot more interest in the moon. What does this mean? It means that one, in the past, especially our our parents and our grandparents who, if they have the ac had access to working in space, they worked on one thing for 20 years. 20 years. What does that mean for the workforce? What does that mean for education? Nobody has 20 years to devote to trying to get their PhD. Like, I mean, at Georgia Tech, at least after 10 years, I think you have to like basically reapply and restart because the technology moves so fast. So 20 years to get one thing up and up, up and running meant that you didn't really get launch experience. You didn't get true engineering experience to know whether or not the work you did um, mattered. And for that matter, I'm I am a I am a millennial. I'm actually closer to Gen, Z, Gen X, which makes me a zenio. Um, but Gen Z and Gen Alpha. They understand the concept of jumping um, project to project every two to three years because, quite frankly, it's upward mobility. So you don't have people staying in the workforce for 20 years to work on one project to get the experience that we're expecting. Um, so knowing that, what, is th what does that mean? In the last five years, we've had all this great things happening, where whether it was commercial commercial space coming through, new projects that have been 20 years in the making coming through, new renewed interest in the moon coming through. That's just the last five years. And that means that, quite frankly, the new economy is shifting. And you have to think about what does that look like for you, whether you're a business person trying to be part of the entrepreneurship side and actually create new businesses, whether you're an engineer looking for new projects, or you are a person that just wants to consume new projects because you want to be on the cutting edge. So, pause, so moving forward. The real question isn't what happened in the last five years, because that's a that's a pandemic, unfortunately, that happened. The real question isn't what happened in the last five years. The real question is what's going to happen in the next five years. So tourism, I think we're going to really start seeing tourism coming, um, pushing off. Um, we already see commercial launches to the ISS. 
we already see companies building new types of habitats because the ISS is supposed to come down, um, um, is supposed to come down. We're staying in, in, in space manufacturing, which is where um, my wheelhouse is right now when it comes to the startups I'm actually working with, whether it's 3D printing, um, lunar mining, recycling, propulsion, ORUs, which I'll get into in a little bit in one of the other later sections. But we're seeing a lot more of in-space manufacturing goods, consumer goods that we can actually consume right now. We're also seeing, we're also seeing, maybe this was on my side. Uh, we're also seeing a lot more healthcare from space because quite frankly, space is a very isolated, isolated experience. If we can figure out healthcare remotely, um, that means that we can figure out healthcare remotely here. So if you have the best brain surgeon, say, in another country, that person can actually contribute to someone um, 5,000 miles away because we have telemedicine, we have robotics, we have the connection points that, that are necessary. Semiconductors and chips. And again, I'll get into this in the next section, but things work differently in space. Quite frankly, crystals crystals grow much larger in space, meaning that there's a lot of a larger ROI. What happens when, we, when we're actually manufacturing things in microgravity? So we're actually seeing that you can actually get better quality products that actually utilizing space. So what that accumulates into is the changes, right? So one, education. As I stated before, like our parents, our grandparents, someone had a, a career for 20 years working on one thing versus now we have a much more rounded out education. So university had to start specializing in aerospace engineering. There was no aerospace, well, there was no space part of aerospace engineering in 1957. Like when I did undergrad, my aerospace engineering was actually an aircraft. Now, yes, I did propulsion systems. I um, I balanced out planes. I actually did a military aircraft for my senior design project. Um, but switching over to actually working in space, completely different set of fluid dynamics. And, you know, shouts out to all my students that are working in thermal because I still barely survived that class. Um, but huge and a very important part when it comes to aerospace and working in space. Um, but for that matter, we found that the defense sector actually supported educational outreach. We see the Lockheed, the Raytheons, the Boeings of the world actually have interns coming in. So they can actually train this entire workforce because they want to, one, support their own contracts, but two, it's, it's, it's a greater good. We also see the public good that comes from space. And this is a larger conversation, I think, what drives the whole space economy. But having communications, weather and climate, um, climate, information technology, GPS, timekeeping. I don't think people understand how important timekeeping is from our GPS satellites. Um, I have a Fitbit and my Fitbit likes to be one or two minutes behind every now and then. No big deal for me. But can you imagine a one minute time difference between the stock the, in the stock exchange? Like that's a major issue. We don't understand. I don't think we um, state, or for that matter, it's not even that we state it. We don't market how important the timekeeping is when it comes from our our, our satellite as aspects. Um, logistics, another huge one, right? Aircraft logistics, where you, whether you're tracking climate, not climate, excuse me, tracking weather that can affect logistics right now, or just tracking your plane to make sure that two planes don't crash and actually um, uh, make sure that air traffic control works. Again, huge logistics, and it doesn't even have to be aircraft, it could be trucks. So there's so much public good and technology transfer that comes out of having a space program. But again, it was only accessible to governments, it was only accessible to civil servants. So they were the only ones who had access to, to entrepreneurship and to think about how we can actually contribute to that. And I think last but not least on the public good side, I just wanted to highlight the cooperative agreements. Um, I'm American. I grew up, born and raised in Chicago. Um, I did undergrad in Boston at Boston University, got my PhD at Georgia Tech. Um, I did my thesis work at J NASA JPL. Um, but I've had uh, had the pleasure and the privilege of being able to travel. And I love to travel. And I bring it up because I think when I speak about space, it's very easy for me to focus on NASA. But quite frankly, every country has had contrib contributions in space. I remember seeing a picture of some of, of some engineers in India actually um, having a rocket, a launch rocket on their bikes because they were actually trying to get it to an area so they could actually safely launch and test it. So it's very easy for 
it's very easy and a very privileged place to say, oh, NASA did this, NASA did this, or, um, or the Cold War or whatnot. But I want to just like, one, respect the fact that every country has contributed to space in different ways and ways that they can. And it, might not, it may not be necessarily hardware, but there's definitely contributions there. And I'm bringing up that public good because we play very well in space with each other because we recognize how important it is to every single country. And we have these cooperative agreements, we have these relationships, we have these treaties, and it means that more people can participate in space. So you're not only um, you're not only allowed to participate in space if you're in a privileged country. So I just wanted to bring I wanted to bring that part up because again, I am an American. I am coming from Chicago. I am coming from um, having like thinking NASA was the ultimate be all. And now that I'm older and I've had all these experiences abroad, I can bring up, hey, I understand that there's a lot of other contributions out there. Um, but again, that's a public good because it means that I come in, I come into contact with so many people and I come into contact with so many other um, ways of thinking that we have to we have to be very cognizant of that. And then last but not least, I think the biggest change is lo a lower barrier. So cost to access space is dropping per kilogram. It's absolutely dropping. Like we don't have the shuttle system anymore because quite frankly, is what we call not economically viable because we thought that was going to be much, much cheaper than it was. And we're seeing that now because um, because of a lot of VCs, a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of like the idea of moving fast and failing, failing fast. We're seeing electronics giving, getting a lot smaller. So that 20 year project that had that had to be a mission that lasted 15 years, we're seeing CubeSats that have to last five years. We're seeing, well, Three to five, three to five years. Although if they don't, if they don't work, we're seeing that okay, well they're small enough that they'll re-enter the, the atmosphere on their own within five years. So electronics getting smaller, having peep pods for CubeSat, because again, twenty years or senior design project where you build a CubeSat and if you're lucky enough to win a win a spot, you can actually launch it in probably your first or second year of graduate school. These are all parts um, um, contributors to allow us to actually contribute to, to allow us to access new space. And those driving factors of, you know, the education side, the public good, the low, the lower cost has been really driven by a lot of economic incentives and a lot of tech advancements. So those implications in particular mean that you don't have to be an aerospace engineer. You could be the best semiconductor engineer because you can always make electronics get a little bit smaller. You can be an entrepreneur and actually launch be like like Astra, where they launch like those funding vehicles where they have the VCs and the SPACs and go the cyber route. Or you can do collaborations where let's say you're a chef and you want to actually figure out what the next like dining experience in space is going to look like. You can do a public private partnership. So the ex example I like to use there, um, I actually and again, bear with me here. I have an idea, like what if like space tourism took off? And we'll talk about what it looks like to ideate your ideas. But what if space tourism took off? What are you gonna do? I'm sure like I'm sure you're gonna have a good cup of coffee. So you can actually work out things, right? And I actually start looking into like, well, what type of coffee do they drink in space? What does it look like to have coffee in space? What does it look like to have hot water in space? Because you can't just have coffee grinds. So there's literally a company that a, a coffee company, a coffee brewery company that partnered with NASA to figure out how they can actually drink coffee in space. And those are those are relationships. Those are all collaborations. You don't have to start from scratch. You could literally be the person that says, I just have this one piece of, of knowledge. And if you're willing to work on the tech with me, we can figure it out. And again, marketing, renewing that interest in tourism in the moon. Like I said, Artemis is another big one that's coming. And we're seeing that renew that renewed interest because Artemis is, is such a large project of trying to get um, humans back on the moon. And another interesting story about that is that I want to say it was the 90s that Hilton actually was looking at how can they make sure that they're the first company to make hotels on the moon so you can actually have habitats that are branded by Hilton. Hilton is not a space company. They're in hotels and services, but they had the thinking and the marketing idea to say, okay, this will come. People will need a place to stay. Let's make sure it's a Hilton experience. So Again, those implications, that driving factor is that you can think of different ways to participate in space, and it doesn't always have to be only the, techno the, the technology piece. Um, education, I think, is a very interesting one, because as I said, now you can do a senior design project or a graduate school project where you design a CubeSat and actually build it and launch it, right? 
So new tools and techniques and how we interact with space. Because what if you're just, not just, but what if you are a computer science person and you're really working on the front, the frontiers of AI? Like that's a great place, like a great place that's going to speed up innovation in particular that you don't have, again, you don't have to understand aerospace. You just have to understand how you can apply your knowledge base. And that education piece is something that we can actually um, absolutely um, contribute to. So just summarizing very quickly, um, we've talked about the definition, which is the full range of activities and use of resources for to create value and benefits in space, um, the past and present. So as I said, um, governments and only civil servants were the ones that only had access to space, access to knowledge, access to actually um, sitting things up and down. And then the future. So like I said, private citizens and everyone's going to participate. Like what type of products would you actually want to see coming from space? Should you make that product? Um, because it's changing in the landscape. So I'm going to pause here. And um, also, if you can help me with this, if anyone has any questions, if you don't have questions, it's okay. It's, it's completely okay. Um, these are my questions for discussion. So what's your favorite space project? Um, would you go, I, would you do space tourism to the ISS, the moon, or Mars? Um, would you use products made in space? And would you spend 20 years on a project? Project. So feel free to put in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand and, or ask um, where you're at. And if not, if no one asked anything, I assure you I have, quite, I have answers to these. But I just wanted to first pause here because, again, um, I wanted to break this up into a discussion piece. My second part is actually much longer, but I wanted to give a pause here to hopefully make sure if anyone had any questions on what I've, I've, I've kind of presented to start. While anyone's speaking, I'm going to answer my answer my answer these on my side. So, my favorite space project. Um, well, let me start with the what I go to ISS Moon and Mars. Um, I personally would love to be an astronaut. I would volunteer for the ISS and I and volunteer for moon, the moon. I would not volunteer for Mars. Um, my favorite space project actually was JWST because one, it's amazing to see all the new imagery coming from it. Um, but I personally would not spend 20 years on JWST. I think one, I would get frustrated. Two, I'd be worried that where will my career actually produce something? Um, but the reason I bring it up is that one, on the ISS, you can go up and come down. There's pretty regular, regularly scheduled um, launches. The moon, I think that that's going to be a longer, um, a longer relationship. And I think once we get the services down, that we will absolutely see more like longer term research on the moon. I know there's projects in the, in, in the NASA space sig of looking at that. Um, I think it's fast enough, a fast enough turnaround that I'm like, yeah, I can go and I can always come back. My personal favorite Mars is that I'm is that it's a six year commitment. It takes two years to get to Mars. You have to stay for two years so that you're in alignment and then another two years to actually come back. Now, is that worth it? Absolutely. Is that worth it for me personally? Um, I don't think so. And I say that because I know with the moon, I want to see my mama whenever I want to see my mama. You know, I can I can go to the moon and come back, you know, three months, six months, uh, maybe a year. That is absolutely completely reasonable to me. But when it comes to Mars, a six year commitment, that's too much change for me personally. And I think there's a really interesting conversation going on with if you if we call and quote unquote colonize Mars, which I personally don't like that word colonize because we really need to rethink what it looks like. Um, but if we go to Mars and we settle on Mars, um, is that a one-way trip? Um, do we have the right to make that make that decision for our children and for our grandchildren? Because if you're born in Mars, which I'll get into in the next so segment of how gravity affects our body and, gra and what type of environment we're in, um, they may or may not, their bodies may or may not be able to function on Earth. Um, if anyone's ever watched the the series The Expanse on Amazon, they actually do a pretty good job of, of talking about the different ways like your body is uh, um, your your body would actually um, react to um, being born in different places. Um, so I think there's one ethical question too. You know, someone has to be brave enough to do it, and I think that those people exist. I don't think I'm one of them just yet, um, and I also don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. Um, so it's okay for me to not be one of them just yet. I think that. That's a question for probably like my children or my grandchildren to answer. Um, let me pause. Is there any questions or chat in the, anything in the chat? If not, I'll I'll head off. Okay, I'm gonna assume there's not. Um, but again, if there are anything, um, also please feel free to step in and, and pause me anytime. Okay. 
Um, oh, I didn't answer the last one. What I use products made products made in space. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we use products um, that have contribute have been um, beneficial from technology developed in space every day. Um, I think that once we get to a place where we actually have more regular launch, especially the ISS coming up and down, um, we're going to see a lot more innovative, like higher quality products um, just because of the nature of microgravity. And I think that it's going to become regular that we utilize we utilize um we utilize products made in space all the time. So absolutely, from my perspective. Hey, do you think that the products made in space could manage the gravity once they come right down? Uh, great question. So short answer, yes. So um, and I talk a little bit about this when I get into the verticals in the next section. Um, but short answer, yes. So there's certain things that grow um, that grow and are manufactured better in space. So things like protein crystals. I think a lot of healthcare is going to be done in space. Um, our cells actually uh, work differently in space, so we can actually study aging um, on on the ISS. So I think that um, one, we will. There's certain things that we will see higher quality in. I think that we have to dial that in. So they'll definitely be able to one create them in space, and then we actually have, I think, a better um, logistics and transportation system that comes back and down, that comes um, back and forth. We'll, actually, we'll absolutely be able to utilize our um, products in space. And part of my expertise that I'm developing right now is doing in space manufacturing, which I'll get into in the in the, the next section. Um, and I'm absolutely seeing like some really incredible things happening that um, people are proposing to manufacture in space. And we've seen a lot of great proofs of concepts for them. So absolutely. I'm going to move forward, but again, feel free to hop in anytime. So the next section I call uh, navigate. So I want to talk about navigating um, a little bit of the space entrepreneurship side. So first, I think we need to understand microgravity and understand the environment that we are potentially trying to work in. Now, I am assuming that a lot of people are um, are engineers or already work in this context. So this may be a little redundant for you, but, you know, stick with me here. Um, then I want to kind of talk about some of the opportunities and challenges that 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 makes. So speaking specifically about excuse me, about the technology evolution and how space, I think, will evolve. That's what I want to talk about, those opportunities, um, those opportunities and challenges. And then finally, I want to go into the verticals, which for me is the most interesting part. So part of what I do is, well, sorry. my strength is breaking up, breaking down very complex topics to any level. So explaining very complex topics is one of my strengths. Another one of my strengths is strategy and dreaming. Like I am a dreamer. And this is something I think everyone needs to learn about themselves. You need to learn, like, are you the person that can dream like me that goes from A to triple Z? Or are you the person that's more of an executor? So you go from A, uh, point A to point B. Because one, you need both. You need someone with vision to dream and in, uh, in such where you're going. And you need someone with execution to really focus on the details. But my strength is more so that A to Z strategy of like, okay, I envision it could be this way. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I get in the verticals and what I think it can look like. Um, I'd love for anyone, again, I hope this is like one of my goals for this talk is that I hope it inspires you to think of like what else it could look like. Um, and I'd love to go back and forth with anyone who has an idea or wants to wants to discuss that. Um, but the point is, is that navigating this one, you need to understand, you need to understand the context. So first, Microgravity. Um, there's gravity in space. Now, it's not much, but there is gravity in space, and which is why it's called micro. So we're talking like on the level from, from negative four to negative six, depending on where you're at. And Earth's gravity well is very, very strong. So this is a really great comet that com comic, excuse me, that explains it quite well of how hard it is to get off of get out of Earth's gravity well. So Jupiter huge right jupiter actually is the garbage can of our solar system like a reason a lot of things don't hit us you know i mean rep to the dinosaurs but then the reason why a lot of things do not hit us is because jupiter's gravity well is so it's so strong that most things are actually drawn to jupiter before it's drawn to earth but the point is is that how hard it is for you to get off get out of our earth um see, get out of our gravity well is quote unquote how expensive it is to do it so you can see earth on the on uh, on the left, so it's um the what is it the dark blue 
um, the dark blue. So imagine how hard it is to get off of Earth versus it is to get off of Jupiter. Obviously, we've only done a lander on Jupiter, so we haven't really tried to, we haven't tested that theory out. But the point, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the heart, the harder it is to get out of that gravity well, the more expensive it is for us to overcome it. And by expensive, I'm talking about propellant. I'm talking about delta V. I'm talking about how hard it is to actually um, push off of push off of our Earth to get to orbit. And you can see on the insert on the right about how much easier it is to push off of the moon because the moon doesn't have nearly as much gravity. Again, I, rec I again, this is a very easy way to explain like the impact of microgravity on uh, oh, microgravity on Earth, and I use this comic because I think it's actually a really good representation of what you're looking uh, of what what you're looking at of how hard it is to get there. Now that said, once you deal with the lack of gravity, how hard it is to get off of Earth, the other things you have to think about is the radiation. So the positive, endless amounts of energy, that's great. The negatives is that if you're not shielded from that. Radiation is not good for you. Um, we are shielded largely, largely by our. Um, we're shielded largely from um, solar flares and, and basically space weather because of the way Earth is. The Earth is set up. Mars has a very small atmosphere, and it which makes it very hard. So, with Mars, it has enough of atmosphere so you can actually try to land, and you'll absolutely crash if you don't if you're not in the right angle, or you'll skip off into skip off. So it's very hard to actually land on Mars, but that very atmosphere is what actually protects us day to day while we're living here. And then when we look at the makeup of what the atmospheres are of each of each planet, you can see here, um, obviously, Earth is the third one. Um, well, Venus is much closer, right? But one, Venus has 90 bars of pressure. Our Earth has one one bar of pressure. So imagine like having the equivalent of, of 90 weighted blankets on top of you and having to move through that. So that's one. Two, you can see we have 20% oxygen here. Now, to be fair, Venus and Mars both have lots of um, CO2. The problem with CO2 is that it takes a lot of energy to actually um, separate that carbon from that oxygen so you actually get the oxygen inside. So you actually have to do a lot of work in order to just make an atmosphere that you can live on. I think that one of the funniest things I learned from um, um, from the, the NASA Johnson setup was that they were saying how whenever they get a new um, a new set of astronauts in, that means they get new air in, right? Because you can't just open the window, so they actually get to circul circulate the air. So imagine um, having like, you know, your, your new set of air every single time. If you're on Venus, you're closer to the sun, a lot more radiation, a lot more pressure, a lot of energy to separate that CO2. You're on Mars, a lot further away from the sun, still need the same amount of energy to set up that CO2 is not as readily available, and then you can also see the pressure. Like Mars only has about a third of the gra the gravity um, uh, the gravity available. So the reason the reason I'm bringing this up is that depending on where you're interested in entrepreneurship, you have to think about the environment that you're actually um, you're actually working in. As I said before, I'm more of a yeah send me to the moon type of girl. Um, but I don't want to stay and stay in the moon unprotected from the radiation. Um, I'm not particularly interested in going to Venus, um, although I did a really great um, project, um, a really great project to do a Venus lander so we can actually learn more about the surface of, Ven of Venus. Um, but I'm not particularly interested in, in we're dealing with that radiation. And plus, I really don't like heat. I'm not, I'm no, no on the heat side. You know, I'm really worried about climate change right now. <laughs> um, Mars, like I said, is a six year, is a six year time frame. So me personally, I'm interested in things that I can do on the ISS and the moon. But if you're interested, and what it looks like to do entrepreneurship for places like Mars, for places like Venus. Again, you need to understand the understand the environment that you're working in and why you're working in that environment. First takeaway from this segment is that in order to participate, we really have to understand where it's going. And I thought it would be interesting to one walk you through historically what it looked like for when you actually have you actually have what we call a commodity. So Starting with this, you have something called a commodity, which is literally just something of interest, of something of value. Uh, and I'm using electricity as an example here. So you have a commodity of electricity once it was invented. Um, once we understood it, we created infrastructure around it, which is why you have a city grid, which is why you have access to um, access to electricity. Then we started interconnect it. So now you can actually build your home, have 
build your home and actually connect it to the residential side. And again, this is, think of this as the role of government once you have a good commodity. And you can apply this to electricity. You can apply it to what I think is the best example and the best um, parallel to space, which would be um, open like oceans and open water, right? Interconnectivity meant that you can actually um, connect your house to it directly and you can actually build a home that's directly connected to it rather than having to have a generator. Like it could actually tap into the city grid. You have a platform because now that you're in your home, you have a standard of how you connect your appliances in your home. So now you can have any appliance you want as long as it connects directly to the electricity provided to your home, which is provided to the city grid. We standardize that. So once someone recreated one refrigerator, they can, like anyone can create a refrigerator and it has inter and it's interchangeable because it connects all to the same city grid. And then we have automation. So it's that idea of like your, your fridge can actually have AI, like an AI component where it tells you like, okay, your milk's about to go sour or you need to order more of this, order more of that. Or you could be shopping, you can connect to your home, which you can then connect to your fridge and tell you what food you actually have in the fridge so you don't have to, so you don't over overbuy. I mean, shouts out to all of us who buy that one package of salad because you think that, oh, I need warmer package. It's like, nah, you didn't, oh, you didn't eat the one before. Um, but that's kind of the idea of technology, of a technology evolution. You have a commodity and then once we understand that commodity, we start building infrastructure around it. We start connecting to that infrastructure. We start creating a platform so it's easier, and then we standardize it, and then we automate it. So I want you, hopefully that makes a sense on a on a technology evolution side. So when we think of space, I think we're in that standardization side, which is why entrepreneurship is possible right now. So the commodity itself is space. The infrastructure are the fleets that we have. So satellite fleets, the ISS, um, GPS, commercialization, commercial um, communication satellite fleets. The interconnection um, are, the, are, are the network. So being able to have, anyone can connect to GPS right now from your phone. Anyone has the same, the same time. Like I said, the timekeeping one, whew, it's a beast, quite frankly. Um, anyone can connect directly. So we're actually trying to make sure that there's coverage all over the place so that everyone always has access um, always has access, and that's the different fleets and different um, orbits that you can actually put in. Platforms, like I said, 20 years for one satellite. Now you can do a senior design project, a senior design project where you design it in your senior year, or build it in your first two years of grad school, and actually see it launched by the end of your PhD. The Peapod did wonders when it comes to having a new platform, and for that matter, entire companies are built off of that Peapod platform because now we're using CubeSat for entire entire fleets. Now, low Earth orbit fleets, but still fleets. So imagine having your entire company built off something that was really supposed to be an educational tool. But wait, we can actually we can miniaturize this to the point where we can have an entire fleet and entire companies based off of this. Um, just data. So this is the data that you um, utilize for um, getting that bird's eye view of the planet when it comes to climate and weather. And again, what can you just do with data? There's a conversation, and again, I live in um, the Bay Area, so in tech that they talk about, you know, software is going to eat hardware. Well, if you just, quote unquote, just have access to the data, what can you do with it? And just is huge when it comes to that, whether it is climate and weather or just for that matter, land erosion, understanding how um, land erosion or like if, again, I live in California, I'm from Chicago. So when we have the earthquakes, I look a little crazy. but we can actually look at the the just data, the 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 um, planetary data and actually see how much did that 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 plate shift, how much um how much erosion has happened to that iceberg, um how much has the water risen, and not just and not only do it by um quite frankly by hand, uh, launch vehicles another huge one the fact that we have small launch vehicles and not only the large ones for those twenty year projects you know those are that's the you know, those are the that that is a very underserved market, and the fact that there is vision, so we can have launch launches that happen every day, every week, every month, rather than oh, nope, you got to wait three months. Okay, it's been pushed back. You got to wait another six months. That's a paradigm shift, but that's a platform that allows space entrepreneurship to happen. Finally, standardization. Um, my old boss, Dr. Wirtz, actually wrote the um, system um, system engineering handbook for spacecraft. So if you ever use SMAT, that's my old boss. Or even the new SMAT, still my old boss. 
but we standardize how we design spacecraft and at least how we educate people on how we design spacecraft. And we've kind of standardized buses, i.e. the CubeSat bus, or um, a lot of people use nano racks. Like we've standardized those buses. Every, um, what's the word? Um, every government, con not every government, but like large government contractors have their own buses that they can sell you directly. And it's already been standardized because it's already been tested. And the fact that that happens, that means you don't have to be an entire spacecraft expert. You can be a payload expert. And that means that you can focus, focus your, um, uh, focus your field on what you're good at. So if I have any biologists out there, you don't have to be a spacecraft expert to have an entire biology experiment on a spacecraft that gives you better, that gives you a better result. And I think that that's where we're at right now. And I think that it's exciting um, for me because I like entrepreneurship. I like the messiness and the chaos of, of focusing on like, no, nah, I just need you to get an MVP. I just need you to get it up there. I just need you to get to where you want to be. But I think we're going to see a lot more interesting things coming from the automation side. And automation isn't just AI. I'm talking about from the automation side of marketing, where I said that I think we're going to see people actually utilizing a lot more products coming from space. It's going to be acceptable to use things from space because there's always a market adaptation period, right? Um, people don't trust it for a while. And then all of a sudden you start seeing it, seeing it, it's like, okay, let me try this. And you're like, oh, it, it is better quality. Um, some people are going to go the automation route and never tell you that it's made in space. Um, that's a possibility too. But I think we're going to see a lot more systems because we've normalized how we utilize space and the entrepreneurship side. We're going to start seeing that. And I think that that's where a lot of people have to put their time and effort and energy and to say, what does that look like for me to normalize um, a system on top of the current space system that we have, because we already have these platforms. We've already standardized how we utilize hardware, how we utilize um, software coming from space. I want to take a step back and talk about the role of government, and not a step back per se, but I think because I think the evolution of even when I was talking about commodity to infrastructure, government has played a huge part of that. So there's a small business side where this absolute innovation coming from um, you know, whether it's cyber support, funding opportunities, tech transfer. Um, and I've worked in all on, on all those areas, but government has supported small businesses. And for that matter, it's not just government either, because a lot of um, primes have actually supported and incubated businesses because they small businesses can be small business entrepreneurs can be uh, more agile than the larger ones are. And that makes perfect sense. So Governments are encouraging small businesses, but primes, prime, um, again, this is coming from um, a, a US centric um, perspective, can actually support entrepreneurship as well. Tech transfer. You remember, I said that governments have this idea of public good and this collaboration. And quite frankly, tax dollars, again, US centric mind frame, have paid for the technology to be researched, has paid for this technology to be incubated and developed. So the public should have access to it and the public can have access to it by actually transferring over to make small businesses. So government has, again, U.S. centric perspective, um, has has set it up so that you are able to transfer that transfer that technology through the commercialization because governments want to support commercialization. They want to support this technology for the public good and they want to and Part of the public good is not only having you know, access to space and resources, is actually having new jobs created. So like I said, new education fields, um, new technology transfer, new jobs, entrepreneurship, these are all public goods where our taxpayer, where our tax dollars have actually supported the technology coming in. So I say all that to say, access to space and resources is one of the things that governments, and again, US perspective has has developed and supported. So I want to use this as a way to transition into what I think is the most fun part of this talk, and that's the space verticals. So first of all, what is a vertical? It's a common genre of business types. Um, so services, tourism, in-space manufacturing. Um, what When I say a vertical, I'm talking like um, all the launch vehicles would be considered one vertical. All the spacecraft buses would be considered one vertical. Um, all the habitats, so ISS is a collaborative one, but there's actually commercial habitats that have been tested out. I actually did the Mars Desert Research Station um, in 
um, in Utah, but there's actually habitats all over the world. Those are all verticals of basically ha um, habitats in space. So it's a common genre of, of business types that um, are lumped together. And I think it's very interesting because what you do in one can affect the other, but you can reimagine what it looks like. So to me, this is the fun part. For me, I love the strategy and kind of, again, I'm a dreamer. So dreaming what it looks like. Um, so let's start with ISM. ISM stands for in-space manufacturing. Um, the parts that I think are important here is that ISM is the idea of, and this is how I separate it out. Um, there's other ways to separate, but for me, I step, I think of it as I'm taking a resource from here on earth, bringing it up into space. I am manufacturing, doing something, uh, creating a product in space, and I'm bringing it back down to earth. So it's the, the resource starts in earth, it's manufactured in space, and then I benefit from it here down on earth. So part of those things are one, it's a clean environment. So you have ultra clean vacuum while you're in space. Um, you have an extreme temperatures. So that const the constant hot and cold uh, for manufacturing is something you can utilize to your advantage. As I said before, crystal grows much larger in microgravity. And then um, fluid flow, you can actually um, contribute, can combine things, um, comp combine things in a different way. The difference from ISM versus ISAM is ISAM is, is in space assembly and manufacturing. I think of this vertical as I am actually utilizing resources here on earth, bringing it to space, and then I am contributing to its utilization in space. So IS, ISM might be something where I am creating a new drug therapy in space and then I'm bringing it back down, or I am creating a new telemedicine um, like a te like telerobotics um, telerobotics in space that then I can use that same telerobotics protocol down on Earth. So that's like an ISM example versus an ISAM example is something like, um, and my example here is refueling. I want to actually refuel a satellite in space because I can make propellant in space and I can refuel a satellite whether I'm making it from old satellites or I'm making it from asteroid mining, I can refuel a satellite for the propellant in space. Um, I can do services in space, so that assembly and manufacturing side. So I can actually move a satellite to the graveyard or extend its life because some of the um, electronics are still working and it just I just don't have access to it because it ran out of propellant. So I can go put a, literally just put a, a, an engine on an old satellite and then make it move and have another like five to 10 years of um, 10 years of life rather than having to maybe it cost me a hundred million dollars to make one satellite versus it cost me about 10 million to send a, send an engine. So life extension, perfect example of assembly and manufacturing. Orbital replacement use units. This is where I'm really interested. And I think that this is going to be a game changer when we um, figure this site out. Um, I can change my, my payload. I can um, like I said, whether it's refueling, but what if I just have a bad solar cell and I don't have enough power to actually power the system? If I could replace or repair a, a solar cell on orbit, I think that's what's going to be interesting. Upgrade a payload. So imagine having to use 1990s, um, 1990s computers on the satellites that you have today. If you could literally change out chip or change out the computer, Imagine what you can you you can still get life out of the current satellites on orbit. So I think that's where it's going to be very interesting. Moving on to ISRU. ISRU stands for in situ resource utilization. So ISM and IS, ISM, ISAM both start out with the resources here on Earth going up into space, either bringing it back down to Earth or using it in space. In situ resource utilization is actually using what you find in space to then um, using what you using what you find in space to then um, either create new services, create new products, and that can either go back down to Earth or um, stay in space. The point is, is that you're using what you're in, what's already in space. So a big one is regolith, um, extracting minerals and reusing for 3D printing. Um, there was a huge push for asteroid mining a few years ago, um, and by a few, probably I'd say 10 years or so, 10 years ago. 
Um, and again, extracting minerals and um, metals and minerals for, for propellant is a huge one. Comets, this one is definitely far out there. <laughs> um, you know, can you imagine waiting for Haley, like having an entire business plan on Haley's Comet and waiting eight, what, 80 plus years to actually um, fill, out your, fill out your business plan? Um, you know, if that's you, hey, more power to you. Um, but, you know, what if you could actually capture water and ice coming from comets? Um, ISS, so repurposing, reuse, and recycle. So the ISS is perfect place where I think a lot of manufacturing is going to happen. I think that a lot of um, asteroid mining and um, regolith mining from the moon is the big ones that we hear about. And then I think people are still trying to find the right um, business relationship for that. I actually am looking at a couple of interesting um, um, entrepreneurship opportunities for regolith in particular um, and figuring out like, okay, well, if I get this to you, what you going to do with it? And so I am doing a lot of the assessment right now as to like the viability of doing this. Um, and I want to pause here because and I, I have some more verticals to go through. But I want to pause here that it is ideas are, you know, a dime a dozen. It is easy for me to dream it up because I have a huge imagination. I'm a very vivid dreamer. And, um, but you have to actually then sit down and do the work and sit, and sit down and do the work and figure out the execution. So yes, I like to do A through Z, but I understand the necess necessity of having to do A to B. And part of that execution side of doing A to B is doing uh, what I call economic viability and trying to understand whether or not it makes sense. Um, again, asteroid mining has been around for a while. Um, there's been some demonstrations. There's a lot of really great projects out there that um, are much closer than anyone having quote unquote a new idea for it. But I think a lot of them have fallen short because they weren't economic vi economically viable. And I want to use the word yet here very importantly. Um, the new space economy is opening up because access to space is opening up. Money per kilogram to get to space is lowering. Education is going up. New funding vehicles are coming up. I think that when we get to a point where you look up and there is going to be some level that money to, per kilogram makes it cheap enough to go to space, that it will become more economically viable to just go to space and do some of these things. And until that point happens, a lot of these ideas will not be economically viable just yet. It doesn't mean that we don't start working on them. It doesn't mean that we don't invest in them. It does mean that we have to understand that the technology isn't ready to, the technology may be ready, but the business isn't ready. So you need, once you understand that once the business is ready, then the technology can take off. So I just want to throw that out there that uh, I don't want everyone to go in here, but you know what, I'm going to go mine asteroids because it is quite frankly, a very expensive industry to get into. It doesn't mean you shouldn't, but it does mean you should be smart about what it looks like when it comes to the economic viability of mining an asteroid. And it does mean you have to be very smart about understanding when the economy is ready for it. So um, I guess spiel over. Moving on, another I, another vertical is services. Um, so I talked about the fact that like I'd love to go to the ISS. Um, I'd love to go to the moon. Um, what does dining look like? And not just dining as in like, how am I going to eat my food? But dining as far as, as far as nutrition, like, do you need different food, um, food experiences when you're, when you're in space? How do you actually cook in space? Um, whether it's heating your food up or like, you're not going to be searing and smoking ribs in space. I mean, if you can, please tell me how, because it sounds amazing. But in general, you're not going to be smoking ribs while you're in space. So what does that look like? Food creation and dream creation. Um, I talked a little bit before about um, the coffee experience. Like I said, I wanted to make a coffee bar. But do you get drunker in space? Um, if you have a hot a hot liquid that's um, always in suspended animation right in front of you, how do you make sure you drink all of it and there's not little drop of, droplets going all over the place? So food containment is a really big one. Um, you're not, like I said, you're not going to be smoking ribs up there. So what does it look like to make sure you have the right amount of proteins, fats, carbs, et cetera? Um, do you need a different nutrition mix? I think those are really interesting conversations to have. And again, you don't have to be a habitat engineer to do that. You could be the best food service person 
there is and partner with somebody and say, hey, you know what, I can give you that expertise. I remember meeting someone who was actually looking at utilizing quinoa for um, quinoa for space meals. And they were utilize, they were thinking about quinoa for space meal because it has such a high protein content. They were not aerospace engineers. They were literally in um, A&T people who understood agriculture and understood and under, understood their crops. Again, there's ways for you to utilize, you can for you to participate in space. Again, luxury spa, steam, sauna, massages, sleep, all that stuff is different in space. <laughs> um, you quite frankly need to be able to impact a force on someone and they need to be able, able to stay still. Um, would you have a luxury spa in space? Would you want a luxury spa in space? Can you imagine um, having a sauna and using that type of water for a sauna rather than actually, um, right, actually potable water or growing food? Um, is that ever going to be a thing? I and mean, we could get to the point where we can have these types of experiences, but I don't think we're there yet, which again, technology ready, business not. When the business becomes viable, the technology can take off. So always remember that. Um, beauty. So sorry that I didn't put up put these up all, all on here. So I thought that I think this is the wrong version. Um, I was actually thinking about um, May Gems that always have the cute little teeny tiny afro. I remember thinking like, what happens to our hair hair when we're in space? Like, how does hair grow in space? How do you um, keep what's the word? Um, how do you keep clean? Because again, um, how do you, how do you keep keep clean? Because you're not washing washing the same way in space. You're probably sanitizing. So what does that mean for our skin? What does that mean for uh, washing, uh, washing, washing our, our bodies and um, making sure we don't have contamination everywhere? They absolutely wash in space. So that's not like, um, so please don't take that as the wrong, the wrong way. They absolutely wash in space, but it's definitely very different. So how do you um, make that entire service uh, when you're going through? And then last but not least, education. Least education. So if we were to become a space-faring nation, well, um, not a nation, I guess, space-faring um, um, planet, uh, what does it mean to educate? Because right now we teach STEM and we teach um, arts and arts and um, arts and craft and whatnot, and we teach history. Like, how is education going to be different? Because all of a sudden, now you need to understand your life support systems much more importantly. Like, when's the last time you looked at how to do your ACE, your HVAC unit? Does anyone know how to do their HVAC unit without having to call somebody? Um, all of a sudden you need to know this. That's a new life skill. So like, how do you actually adjust education to be like, this is how you keep alive every day. Finally, tourism. Um, when you travel, what do you travel for, right? Um, I personally travel for history of food. I want to learn the history of a place and I want to taste amazing food. I want to taste their spices. I want to find somebody's grandma to take me traveling and uh, and um, show me and tell me all the the history of like this dish and tell me like oh my my mom's my mom my mom's mom taught me how to do this. I, that's what I want to learn. Um, but if you were to go to the ISS or go to the moon and you're quote unquote a tourist, what will you do? People volunteer, right? So right now we have commercial um, commercial astronauts. A lot of them actually help with research and science because your your time is so um, is so over scheduled. So volunteering to actually do research and science is definitely a huge one. History, um, what history is there in space? I think there's a lot of natural history, right? So actually being able to connect with satellites and see older versions of satellites, um, seeing the stars and um, things, seeing the stars and seeing the developments of stars with no light traffic, I think would be a huge one. Sightseeing, you know, almost a strong with no blockages, right? Um, museums, art, can you do an art installation in space? I don't know if there's any scuba divers here, but um, something that they have like in the Caribbean is that they're actually, um, um statues that they've done art installations in the caribbean that you can actually go and um, uh, um you can actually go and scuba dive to, to scuba dive to um but i'm bringing this vertical up because it is i won't say easy but it's something that i know i've said since i was a little girl that i want to be an astronaut um and i'm an engineer so there's absolutely engineering things that i can do to contribute to um to contribute to space but if you're not an engineer if you're not a research person and you're going on a family trip, you're going as a tourist, what are you going to do as a tourist? Now, let's not play. 
I'm sure we're all going to be like on that one window. So you're actually seeing the earth and like, you know, spotting, you know, oh, I can see, um, see the sun rising. I can see all the different cities and whatnot. And that's amazing. You can have that experience right now by doing like a virtual reality. But if you're actually in space, what does that look like? But, excuse me. All right, I want to pause. Um, I'd like to ask, first of all, if there's anyone who has any verticals they're interested in, and what do you envision for that? And I can maybe speak to that a little bit. So give me one moment. I need to crock off. <laughs> and, um, please, if anyone has any questions in, in the chat. When you think about the um, what you described related, related to services, related to manufacturing, related to the different phases, how do you go from like you're indicated, hey, if we were the best of our field of understanding what quinoa is and growing, or if you're in ag, or if you're in manufacturing, how do you go about researching what the opportunities are to connect the link into? That's a great question. So the question I heard was, how do I, how do I find the resources to actually figure out how I can contribute? Um, I'm sorry. One moment, my I'm. My throat got really dry. I apologize. I'm like, well, go ahead. Um, the first thing I'll say is conferences. Um, the world just opened up, right? So now we're starting to slowly see, um, in-person conferences happening, and that is where all of the collaborations. That's where all the networking happens. So, one finding finding your tribe and finding the in-space conferences. So, um, what is it? I'm about to make up acronyms, give me a moment. Uh, A-S-S-G-R, let me make sure that's the right one. Um, basically, there's a gravitational, um, like I ISS, well, it was ISS RDC, which is a huge one. So if you're actually interested in, um, any projects like going up in the ISS, that's a huge one. They have actually have a really good um they, they have a really good um they have a really great um community um that uh, a really great community that they actually work with work through to actually send up um projects in the, in the ISS. So I would first find conferences around like what you're looking at. So gravitational conferences, ISS conferences, like where you're trying to send it to. I think that's the first first place you want to look at. Excuse me. Um. So first, finding conferences. Um. Two. Whatever you see on the screen is what I need you to talk to when it's not time for the students to talk. The students know what is on the screen and what they're going to talk but the transition time like oh i think i think we're okay sorry um going back to the comment so question where can we find them? one go to conferences two reddit and quora are really great places to actually just like strike the conversations um as to like what are the interesting parts i'm actually part of quite a few reddits and quite a few discords um and core conversations as to like what the future of space and what the future of things look like, just so I can have a sense like, oh, that's a pretty interesting idea. Um, quinoa in particular. So if you're someone that's interested in food, well, who's actually, going, where where would this food be eaten? That's where we're talking ISS. So ISS actually is a really great community that um, they speak to the, um, they, they, they speak to and actually take a lot of research as to like what's possible to actually send them to the ISS. So that's why I look for collaboration as to like, oh, is it possible to get this space certified? Um, I think that when we think of space, at least when I think, sorry, when I think of space food, I think of like the dipping dots. And like I said, I already looked into like, oh, is there coffee in space? There absolutely is. So I would actually then look at those companies like, oh, who actually sponsors um, sponsors um, coffee in space? And I just contact them. Um, you'd be surprised how much, you, how, how far you can get by just sending one email. Like, you'd be absolutely surprised. Like, one email saying, hey, how did you do that? Oh, tell me more about that. Or I will look for the founders of those companies and see if they're if they're giving any, any talks as to, like, where, where they're at. And then I just go network with them. Um, I like entrepreneurship because I like creating, um, creating um, order from the chaos of it all. Um, but a huge part of that chaos is just connecting with people. And I think that people don't see entrepreneurship as accessible to them because they don't network the same way because it's just not 
it's not in our makeup. Um, I know when I was an engineering student, I was just trying to get through. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I was just trying to get through. I was just trying to get that dissertation done. I'm just like, I need five signatures, no more, no less. I'm not doing more. I'm just trying to survive. And I think that um, the networking, especially at conferences and like collaborations and learning how to just email someone like, hey, can you take five minutes is huge. I wanted to talk about verticals a little bit more. Um, so I was saying how my background is actually is in, in, is in system engineering. And the startups I work with are in um, in space manufacturing. What does that mean? Like, <clears throat> what does it mean when I talk about in space manufacturing? Um, one, we go up to ISS like what every three, six, nine months or so. So there's not a what's the word? There's not a regular. It's not it's not as regular as we'd like it to be, right? To actually be able to bring products up, resources up. <clears throat> And bring products down. So if it takes you so much, so long to <clears throat> manufacture something, like what does that look like for when it comes to economic viability of something? So, um, let's say you want to grow food in space, right? Does that make sense? Um, maybe, but it means that if you grow it, it takes what three months? Maybe it takes four months for it to grow. Then you have to wait another three, three months for it to come down. So you have to start thinking about like the cycles of how how often you can get something down. So you need something that has a very long shelf life in order to um, come back and forth. So those are considerations. But you also need something very small. You can't manufacture it. Well, maybe you can. I don't want to. I want to put limitations on anyone. Um, you're not going to manufacture a car in space and then bring it back down. That doesn't necessarily make sense. But you can manufacture things that are very small. So drug therapies, I think, is a huge one because you can manufacture multiple multiple pills at the same time and bring that down. You can manufacture crystal growth. So like so, um, semiconductor chips is a really big one. Um, Red wire just 3D printed a knee meniscus. So actually 3D printing joints in space. That's a really big one that I think is going to be that's going to really take off. We've already we've already shown that you can 3D print in space. Made in space did that. There's a 3D printer on the ISS. <clears throat> There's a lot more 3D printing of like um, organs that are happening, and we're actually trying to figure out how to how to work that. I think that's going to be an interesting vertical. But the point is, is that I'm interested in what can you build in space that's better in space that'll be worked out, worked out here. Um, I also want to say that like the in space manufacturing side is very interesting for entrepreneurship because one, it's exciting, but two, if you're a marketing person and you're just thinking about what you can market. You still need to start thinking through, like, well, do I want to be first in this? Because again, tech may be ready, but the economic viability may not. So you have to see, like, where is it at? Do you want to be first in this space? And if you do, great. Again, it was the 90s that Hilton was saying that, like, we want to market, we want to brand Hilton hotels on the moon. So if you want to be first, that's great. Their brand is strong enough that they can do that. You may not want to be the first one to say, okay, I'm going to be a brand on, on the moon that a brand on a brand on the moon that um no one's heard of just yet. So you might want to be, hey, I'm building a habitat, Hilton, I'll build your habitat, Hilton um brand with me. So you might want to think of it that way. But again, these are all business strategies and they're not necessarily the entrepreneur, the the tech world, but they're very important when it comes to what you're trying, what you're trying, trying to create. Creating your path. Um, for me, part of the conversation behind entrepreneurship is making sure that you understand like what it looks like to move forward. And first, you need to understand what enables new technology. So a lot's going on right now, especially in the world of AI. A lot can, um, AI can actually move your proposals forward quite a, quite a bit. Um, it can also help you understand like other ideas out there. Chat GPT has like been huge. It's not, obviously not the only, but it's definitely the more, um, the most recent one that's out there. Um, I think past that, 3D printing is another really big one. Um, I actually was working at Gantry for the last six years where we were doing 3D printed lighting directly to consumers. So I know the power of what 3D printing can do when it comes to just-in-time manufacturing rather than actually creating, um, what's the word, creating, um, stock that you have to have to keep so i think these are again they're enabling new technologies and enabling new innovation now that said um crispr 
I do not have a biology degree. It's not my thing, but I understand what CRISPR does. So CRISPR has actually been able to greatly change what can be done in biology. And I think a lot of those res of that research is going to be happening in the um, in the coming years, and I think we're going to actually see it contribute to the space world. And I say blockchain finally. Um, now I get it. Some people roll their eyes when you hear blockchain. Um, I am thinking blockchain in the sense of who owns what. So very brief, very very brief um, conversation. Um, we have five major five major treaties when it comes to space. To me, they boil down to don't touch my stuff. We'll help each other if something happens to each other. So that collaborative, if like if the U.S. had astronauts and astronauts and the Europeans had astronauts, like the U.S. would help help each other. Don't touch my stuff. Don't touch my stuff. And uh, nobody owns the moon. So that's basically what our five major. There's a lot of nuance in that, right? But a really big thing that we have as issues is like who owns what. Because like I said, three of our treaties are really around, don't touch my stuff, right? So if I quote unquote touch your stuff, well, wait, is that your stuff? Is that my stuff? Who who owns this? So I think blockchain might actually be very interesting when it comes to um, understanding ownership and legalities of like where things are. So if two satellites collide into each other, one satellite's dead, one satellite's not. Okay, the, the one that had... And by dead, I mean it's unresponsive. Is the one that's responsive in control? So did they technically touch them? Or did this one technically drift into this one? What does that mean? So I think blockchain would be very interesting in that aspect because you can actually, um, what's the word? You can actually understand the chain of command as to when something was last responsive, who actually owns it, and then actually have a better sense of like, okay, what does it mean when two satellites collide? Or for that matter, if I want to, if you need a solar cell and I want to sell a solar cell, how do I put that relationship out there so that everyone understands that this solar cell, ha cell has moved from one to the other? Because again, if my solar cell is on your spacecraft, but your spacecraft hits another spacecraft, but it was my solar cell that got damaged you, do you get to talk to me or who? And it First, when I say that scenario, it probably makes it like, well, no, whoever actually, you know, whoever actually owns it, own transfer ownership, blah, blah, blah. It's not as clear cut as that as that. So I think blockchain might be actually very interesting when it comes to the ownership space and the ownership um, aspect of what happens in space. But when you're creating your path, what is um, I think you have to think of what is your area of interest, what technology would change it, and who should you should collaborate with? Which for me, going from this talk is what are the verticals, what's the technology, and who to, who to collab with. Um, and I wanted people to get from this conversation the idea that you can just, not just, but you can pick an area of interest and figure out a way to contribute and how technology is going to change it. I think AI is going to change how we do proposals, quite frankly. I think AI is going to change how we optimize things. I think that... Um, 3D printing is going to change that we can actually create in space and manufacture in space rather than having to bring it here and then move and then um, pay money to actually bring, bring it up into space. I think we're going to be able to recycle and reuse everything we have in space. I think that's what's going to change it. I think that collaborations are going to change because right now our large government contractors move slowly because they are always um, beholden to whatever the whatever the contract is, whatever Congress is doing. So you may have something that takes you three years to do, but Congress changes every two, and now all of a sudden you have to convince them to let you have that third year funding because they want to chop it. I think that uh, entrepreneurship and smaller business are able to move much more agilely. And that is why larger companies want to collaborate and be able to see that move through because they want they want the things to happen as well. They also they just are beholden to very different standards. I think that in or, like in that vein, you have to do a SWOT analysis, which is your strengths, resources, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And I bring this here because one, yes, it is generic, but two, it's very powerful. You need to do this on yourself as a person. So as I said. My strength is that I'm actually good at um, comp at bringing um, order to chaos. I like very small companies. I like being able to figure out the strategy, and I like being able to support the MVP as to like where it's going. 
my weakness is, is that I like to think A through Z. So when A to B comes, I'm not as interested in that. It's just not my thing. My personal opportunities is that I actually work really well with startups in the ideal phase and the strategy phase. I can give lots of support and push back and be like, hey, have you thought of this, thought of that? I can think of different ways to actually um, execute the same exact idea. But the threat to that is that means that there's not as many opportunities because not as many people are doing entrepreneurship. And I want to see that happen, which is why I'm doing talks like this, but also why I network so much when it comes to um, conferences, because it's so interesting to me. You have to do the same thing on the vertical. You have to do the same thing on the vertical. You have to do the same thing on the technology. And if the vertical, the technology, and the collaboration work, that's when you have to move forward. Um, I think that you have to think in these terms when it comes to that. So if let's use the quinoa example. Um, the strength is that it's very high protein and there's a lot of research that's been, that's been done on it. Um, and I say that, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Peru, but the Incas were absolutely amazing people. They did a lot of scientific experiments like way back in the day, absolutely amazing people. Um, but the point is that a lot of research has gone into quinoa. A lot of research has gone into like, oh, the protein content of it, um, the, the, the ROI of it. Um, a weakness is, it's like, okay, quinoa is very gran granular. Um, how do you utilize quinoa in a way that is not so granular so that you're not going to have pieces of quinoa you're going through when you're in the ISS? So the opportunity is, again, it has a huge ROI on it. So what's the goal of it? If it's the goal is to fit a nutritional need of how much protein, that's a huge opportunity because, again, it has such a large ROI when it comes to protein and growing it. But the threat Again, that granular thing is that you have to understand how, how it works. So same thing with um, if you did 3D printing. Strength of 3D printing is that you just need a resource, but you also need um, energy and power that you can create it where, you, where you're at. A weakness is that it may not be as mechanically sound. An opportunity is that there are ways to optimize through that, that me those mechanical properties. You may not need it to be 100%. Maybe 85 might be, be acceptable. And then what are, the th what are the threats? You might not have enough power. Again, do a SWOT analysis on yourself as to where you stand, the vertical you're actually interested in, and the technology that you think will actually change it. And then again, who are your partners? Um, Hilton may be a great company to want to do Habitat, but they forgot they wanted to do that in the 90s. Go talk to Marriott, right? You have to start thinking, you have to do these analyses on each one of them so you can actually figure out what, what your path forward is. I wanted to throw up a few companies in a few different verticals. So um, when it comes to actually doing, what's the word? Um, testing out your environments, right? There's different ways to do that, right? There's the ISS, which huge proponent of, there's a lot of manufacturing that happens on that. But there's also zero G flights, so the vomit comet, the parabolic flights, right? So you can actually do zero G. I actually work with Aurelia, which actually um, helps students actually put their projects in space and actually see how microgravity will affect it. Um, there's more than one, um, what's the word, aircraft that can actually fly you to space, um, not fly you to space, sorry, fly the parabolic flights. Um, G Space actually works as an AI platform to actually do the do the the development of figuring out products in space. So you can actually design it for space, test it on test it on a parabolic flight to confirm confirm your data, and then you actually go look at the ISS to figure out how to get up there. Um, I highlight Wayfinder um, Privateer um, because I thought it was such an interest. It's a really great product that you can use for free right now to actually see what's up there. So if you're someone that's actually interested in doing like recycling, recycling or anything, you can actually see where all the recycle, like where rocket bodies are and recycle that. Um, years ago, I had an idea of actually creating like a gas station in space where I would collect rocket bodies together and actually make the shell and then actually then work on the services, the services side. So something like Wayfinder is a great idea great product to actually utilize very quickly to think through your ISAM like project projects and the other are really great for ISM projects. Factories in space. Um, this I thought this is a huge resource for me. So again, if you're looking for collaborators and let's say you do not want to be the ones that actually creates a let's say a manufacturing in space. You just need someone else to give you the black box so that you can put your, your experiment in. Factories in Space is a really great um, tool so you can actually see what all the entrepreneurship um, sites are, not sites, sorry, companies are, and what they're doing, what their verticals are. 
But the other ones I have around here are red wire, space tangle, and echo atoms. So um, these are really great if you're especially if you're doing like biology and um, like more health therapies, where you can actually um, put your experiment in one of these in one of these boxes and actually have a sense and actually grow it in space and actually get all the data back and actually get your product back. Um, factories in space, in particular, it shows all the verticals, but um, it's a really great one when it comes to looking for uh, or what's the word, a, collabor a collaborative arm of actually someone who has the hardware. So maybe you don't want to, maybe you just want to do the software, but you can, the, maybe you want to do this, maybe you want to do the biology or you have the software and the data, but you don't want to have to figure out the hardware. These are really great um, quick um, quick units that you can actually contract with them to actually then put your product, product in space. Um, these are ones that I thought were interesting because um, TransAstra in particular, they're actually doing the equivalent of doing um, sort of gas stations in space. So there's a gentleman in Australia who actually has figured out how to use aluminum for propellant and TransAstra and TransAstra, they're not they're not connected, but TransAstra in particular is actually looking at how you can actually make a place where you can actually refill your satellite on the way on the on the way to the moon. So you have one stop there and one stop back and actually be able to do that. And they're actually looking at how to recycle aluminum in space. Um, the point is, is that there's a lot of really interesting um, companies out there that are trying to do um, that are trying to do some interesting things when it comes to what it looks like for um, services, uh, services, tourism, and manufacturing out there. And like, quite frankly, you have to network. So, to the question before, how do you find these companies? Um, one, Google searches are great. Um, two, find your network, find your people. Um, I do a lot of that when it comes to conferences, when it comes to speaking engagements, just like look around what's out there. And then three, email them, <laughs> uh, find where they're going to talk, email them and, and see, hey, can can we, can I take 15 minutes of your time? And in general, and LinkedIn's a really great resource for this, in general, they're very, very receptive. And then finally, for my people that are like, I'm not interested in hardware, I'm just really a, a software person, all the gist data out there, I think is really going to change the game on things. So Planet is actually obviously um, a really big player in the space. Um, Near Space Labs, I actually know the founders, they're actually doing hot air balloons that are um, are are taking data all down to the 10 centimeters. Um, but you can literally get the data, develop a product right now based on the data that they provide that either one of these companies, and there are plenty more out there that provide provides. And then from there, you're able to actually create entire um, entire um, automations and entire um, predictive services on them. So what if you're a person who's in, who's interested in, like you're, you're a C person, you're interested in coastal, coastal erosion, um, you can get that data immediately and then say, okay, well, you can get that data immediately, see what's happened over the last five, five years or so, and then you can make better decisions when it comes to the environmental impact of things. So especially like governments and um, governments and cities trying to figure out like the impact of building um building more like downtown work like a lot of city urban planning they can really see what it did in other countries and other areas that are similar to theirs and actually decide whether or not it's going to have the same impact and again that's data they don't have to be aerospace engineers they don't have to have a hardware a hardware company they can just utilize the data that's actually available coming from these space companies finally um, last point is that you want to iterate. So you can, well, by you, I personally can dream about three or four different schemes and it changes a little bit every single time I think through it. So make sure you iterate and make sure you talk through like what it, what it looks like um, because it's going to change and it should change because as you understand the economic viability, you may have to pivot away from the technology that you're actually thinking about. And as you understand the technology, you might understand that, okay, this is never going to be economically viable. Um, so you have to sit down and think through these conversations and through, the, through this thought process every single time you have to iterate through it. So with that, I know it's been a very long time. I do appreciate everyone um, sitting down and talking with me. Um, I really want to just leave this off, but please remember that there's more in the technology involved in the space economy. One, private citizens can absolutely be involved. Two, you, if you're interested in entrepreneurship side, you can get involved in so many different ways, whether that it's a hardware company, a software company, a marketing relationship, a branding relationship. Um, 
presenting at conferences and finding new collaborations. There's so many ways that you can be a part of it that I want you to think through what it looks like because the new space economy is coming, whether we participate or not. I just think we have a better chance together participating in it. So with that, thank you so much. I know I'm almost out of time. So if there's any questions, hopefully I can answer them um, in the short time we do have. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Uh, this is Era Rezada. I'm taking over from Simone, but we really do appreciate your presentation uh, and your talk over entrepreneurship and uh, a space exploration and conversions of this. So really appreciate it. Do we have any questions for Dr. Taylor? Dr. Taylor, we do really appreciate your time. Uh, this session is being recorded, so we will provide, uh, you know, this recording to our members and it will be on our website as well. So thank you so much for coming over. Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always lovely to see what Nesby's doing and I'm always, um, I'm always here if anyone needs any questions. So please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you.